the former president's to-do list, if he is elected again, is looking more autocratic than democratic, more vengeance than governance. And how do we know that? Well, his own words. Item number one, revenge. The Washington Post reports that he and his allies are plotting to take control of the Justice Department to punish his perceived enemies. Now, this includes President Biden and many of his own former officials, from John Kelly to Bill Barr. It's something that Trump also admits out loud. If I happen to be president and I see somebody who's doing well and beating me very badly, I say, go down and indict them. Mostly, that would be you know, they would be out of business. They'd be out. They'd be out of the election. Now, a reminder that he floated the death penalty for retired chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley. Item number two, he's planning to purge the government of employees to install his own loyalists. Axios reported that 50,000 workers could lose protections, including those in national security posts, intelligence, law enforcement, the State Department, even the military. And of course, he has also said that part out loud as well. This is the final battle. With you at my side, we will demolish the deep state. We will expel the warmongers from our government. We will drive out the globalists. We will cast out the communists. We will throw off the sick political class that hates our country. Item number three, he wants to consolidate presidential power. The New York Times reporting that he would increase his grip on every part of the federal government, from the FCC to the Trade Commission. He could also even refuse to spend money the way that Congress intended. Item number four, He's once again teasing even more travel bans for a wide swath of people. Again, he's saying it out loud. And in my second term, we're going to expand each and every one of those bans because we have no choice. We aren't bringing in anyone from Gaza, Syria, Somalia, Yemen, or Libya, or anywhere else that threatens our security. Number five ideological tests for anyone trying to enter the United States. I will implement strong ideological screening of all immigrants. If you don't like our religion, which a lot of them don't, if you sympathize with jihadists, then we don't want you in our country and you are not getting in, right? We don't want you. Get out of here, you fire. Item number six, in addition to banning many from entering, he is also vowing a historic removal. And we will begin the largest domestic deportation operation in American history. Number seven, also involving immigration, Trump threatening to restart family separations, taking children away from their parents at the border. Remember, some of these families were never reunited. When you say to a family that if you come, we're going to break you up, they don't come. And now, you may recall that his administration actually first denied that this was happening at all, and now he, he's out there touting this policy. We did family separation. A lot of people didn't come. It stopped people from coming by the hundreds of thousands, because when they hear family separation, they say, well, we better not go. Number eight, he says that he'll pardon many of those convicted in the January 6th attack. I will be looking at them very, very seriously for pardons. Very, very seriously. Number nine, he'll attempt to invoke the Insurrection Act. That's according to the Washington Post. He and his allies want to use the military to quash protests. And item number 10, a question mark over the most powerful alliance in the world. In a second, Trump term would almost certainly withdraw from NATO. Trump himself continues to brag about telling NATO allies that he would not defend them unless they paid more. So while many of his Republicans' rivals jab Trump for refusing to debate and be on that debate stage, that particular platform is not necessary to understand his vision, one that includes retribution and spite at the heart of it.
Now, to begin, I want to bring in former Defense Secretary under Trump, Mark Esper. Uh, thank you so much, Secretary Esper, for joining us. There is this reporting that Trump would invoke the Insurrection Act, which would allow him to basically put military troops in American cities to deal with protests, protests that uh, might arise if he were reelected. From your perspective, could anyone in the military push back on an order like that? Well, I, mean, I think if something like that were to happen right after an inauguration in January 20, uh, 2025, I guess, um, look, there would not be a civilian chain of command in place at that point in time, first of all, to push back. So there would probably be an acting secretary, he or she, then would have to decide whether or not to implement that order. Uh, otherwise, the military chain of command would be intact. Now, look, there's another option, too. Most often, people go to the active duty. But there's nothing that prevents the president from uh, asking a governor, a friendly governor, to, um, uh, to mobilize his National Guard to assist as well. And, I mean, ultimately, it sounds like it's likely that it would be an order that is carried out. I mean, would it be legal in your view? If uh, w once the president is signed into office, it is completely legal for for him to invoke the Insurrection Act. Now, there, there are a few steps that have to happen. My recollection is that the process actually begins with the attorney general, and I assume that early in, in, the, in the term, there would not be a, a, an attorney general in place. Again, there would be an acting attorney general. But my understanding, my recollection is the process actually begins with the attorney general making a recommendation to, um, uh, to implement the Insurrection Act. Yeah. So Trump obviously would come into a potential second term with a litany of grievances. He's been very clear about that. And, and there would be, I think, fewer guardrails than perhaps in his first term. What do you think, as someone who served with him, what do you think that could mean for this country? Look, I've, I've told others that I believe the uh, first year of a second Trump presidency would look like the last year of the first Trump presidency. In other words, You'd see him surrounded by a, a lot of uh, loyalists, people who are willing to do his bidding, whatever he wants. Um, and that would be his metric, his litmus test for anybody he brings into, the, uh, into his presidency the second term. I, I think that's the biggest lesson learned for him and for his team. And we know now that they are building lists of people, of loyalists they would bring into office. We know right now who some of them are. But uh, he's not going to make that same mistake twice. Hmm. There's also, obviously, a war in, is between Israel and Hamas, a war between Ukraine and Russia. And, and Trump, uh, looking abroad, could very well make good on his desire to rethink U.S. alliances, especially NATO, which he's been incredibly critical of. Uh, even if another president who came later tried to undo a change like that, pulling the United States out of NATO, for example, what would that mean for the United States and its standing abroad going forward? Sure. Well, look, I think a, a real consideration is the fact, and, and he's talked about it already, that were he to come into office, I think he would cut off funding for Ukraine. And uh, that, of course, uh, would, I think would, would, would initiate uh, a collapse of Western support for Ukraine in, the, in its conflict with Russia. The United States support is like the, the biggest block in a Jenga tower. And once you pull us out, I think it all falls apart. And then I think the question will be, at what point in time does he move to pull the United States out of NATO? Maybe he makes a move to pull U.S. forces out of Germany first. That's something I pushed back against and was able to, to, uh, to uh, reposition troops uh, closer to Russia at the time, actually. But I suspect at some point he would look to actually pull U.S. forces out of NATO if also that he saw that our European partners weren't contributing their fair share to the alliance.